Washington. Maybe in conclusion, for me, I do think the world has been singing of access to all, access to ARVs, access to treatment, universal access. You can't go on singing this universal access for all without inclusion of people with disabilities. I think it's a high time for us to achieve universal access. This 10% has to be involved. We need to be included in all the achievements so that by 2010, as we are even moving on with our advocacy, you will have been very successful in the universal access for all. Washington, I want to, I want to, I want to make this conversation more concrete now because I think we've established the, the landscape. But you're someone who's working day in and day out at the intersection of these issues, and it would be great just to ground all of these abstract issues in reality. If you could tell us about your project and how you how you how you found yourself at the intersection of AIDS and disability work. And then we can start talking about stigma and about challenges in terms of research and funding and other practical issues grounded in, in a real experience of, of frontline work. Thank you very much, Avi. Our program at Liverpool VCT was started as a deaf program, service provision to the deaf. Because Liverpool VCT offering counseling and testing, we did realize that the deaf community was facing a challenge when they were coming to access our services. And we felt we need to address this. Our deaf program, the aim behind it was, we didn't want to just come up with a separate program, but we just came up with it as a mainstream program in within the programs in Liverpool. We brought together different stakeholders. As Rachel had said, there are already existing stakeholders working on disabilities, and we felt we need to include them. We identified the deaf, we trained them, and we again employed them and mainstreamed them in the already existing Liverpool programs. And Liverpool VCT is simply a Kenyan non-governmental organization, which is really working hard because we realize for us to impact on the effective strategies in addressing HIV and AIDS, there was need to recognize and respect the sexual and reproductive health needs of the people with disabilities. Hence, we felt there was need for us to provide direct, sensitive, and acceptable services to the people with disabilities. Since our inception as a program, we recognized that not only deaf people need counseling and testing services, but other disabilities like the blind, the physically handicapped, the mentally handicapped, need support to be able to access these services. For the past four months, we at Liverpool VCT in Kenya, we started doing community mobilization campaigns We've been bringing on board other organizations of people with disabilities. But the great challenge we've faced as a disability program, indeed, many funding agencies, international implementers, international AIDS organizations do not have disability on their agenda, neither in their priority areas. That's one issue that we've realized. Another challenge, it has been the policies. The policies are not disability specific. They're not mentioning anything on disability. And we are feeling, as an organization, there is need for us to work and address these areas. Another issue, the capacity of the disabled people's organizations really needs to be addressed. For all the implementers, for us to make an impact in HIV and AIDS, there is need for dialogue to be between international agencies, funding agencies, and the disabled people's organization. Thank you very much. So you started providing services within the disability community. And then I guess HIV AIDS demanded your attention. So, so the question is, how did, for, could we need to look at this from both sides. So from the point of view of, of disability services shifting into an, an HIV AIDS paradigm, what were you forced to confront that you didn't have to before? And what did you bring with you from dis providing services to disabled people that the AIDS community could learn from? At Liverpool VCT Disability Program, we've learned one thing that we would wish to share with the AIDS community, that for any effective program to run and be very effective, there is need to really bring on board the people with disabilities, engage them, 
don't just bring programs to them and implement without their engagement. Engage them even in the inception. Engage them in the drafting of those policies. Engage them from the start. And also you need to do effective community mobilization. Use ways that can really be approachable to the people with disabilities. Build the capacities of the stakeholders because that's what Liverpool VCT we did. We built the capacities of the organizations working with people with disabilities to help them be very responsive. Without effective community mobilization of the disabled community, we may not be able to have any effective impact. And another thing that we've really realized, peer-to-peer -peer approach is very important. Disabled people who are peer educators are easy to approach and mobilize their disabled counterparts. counterparts. Without them, you cannot have any impact in the community. Yet, Nibers, did you want to address this? Yeah, uh, I just want to show you one thing, since I have the privilege to sit besides uh, Matilda, I have got a good secret that every one of you are going to be given land in Mexico City. <laughs> I assume every one of you have got a very good land in a very center area, I think around the downtown, she said. So you build a very nice building, which is very much decorated and which, which is very much fancy. Everything modern in the world is there in your building and you furnish it with the latest thing in the world. Everything fulfilled. That building doesn't have a door. And what will be the fit? All those modern, very expensive, updated things will be stolen out. <laughs> so we are the door to close the way for HIV AIDS. Unless you close the door, all your sisters and brothers, including yourself, will be stolen by the thief who has gone inside by the unclosed door. Thank you. From our metaphor department. <laughs> Um, one, of, one of the intersections which I think bears some, some complicating is the question of stigma. This is something that people uh, with disabilities and people working in the disability world have been facing for many decades and generations before HIV AIDS came upon us. And there are some significant intersections. But there are also stigma, stigmas and, and stereotypes that disabled people face that di relate directly to sexuality and to vulnerability to HIV AIDS. And I'm not sure if they're the same or not. So let's start talking about some of those specific stigmas and stereotypes that disabled people face that make them more vulnerable to HIV AIDS. And we'll see how much overlap there is. Does anyone, I'm throw that to anyone who wants to start. Rachel? Yes, I think uh, the most uh, painful thing is for, especially a, a woman with a disability because of the cultural beliefs that I, I, may, I, I will be relating to Africa because I don't know much what is happening outside Africa. But according to African setup and the cultural beliefs that are there, when you are a woman with a disability, they think that you don't have sexual feelings and therefore you are not marriageable. And because you are not marriageable, then there's, there's no way you can have uh, the HIV and AIDS. Therefore, what is believed in uh, the African setup, there is a belief that if somebody has uh, HIV, then they are told by the witch doctors to go and have sex with a, a woman with a disability. Then they believe that their HIV will go away because they, they have slept with a woman with a disability. But in the actual sense, they are infecting the women with disabilities in, in that process. And as a result, you find that many w women with disabilities are dying because they are infected in the process. And at the same time, because they are being denied the right to family life, and they, because of that belief to say they are not marriageable and they cannot be loved, you find that uh, uh, during the night, the same men who have those, that belief, they'll be coming in to have sex with the women. But when it is during the daytime, they don't have to have an association with the women. So as a result, when they are sick, when they are infected with the HIV, it is also another problem. 
because people cannot accept them, even the medical personnel at the hospitals. They don't relate their sickness to HIV and AIDS because they have that belief that the, the persons with disabilities cannot be infected. As a result, even when there are these opportunistic diseases related to HIV and AIDS, they are not treated because they feel they are not related to HIV. As a result, they just give them maybe just ordinary painkillers. And in the process, they die silently without anybody treating them. And even at the same time, they have this uh, discrimination to say, if you go to the hospital, even visiting the VCT centers, it's not even accessible. You find that there are these steps or whatever, there's no sign language interpretation, there's no braille interpretation. Even if you manage to go, to, to go there to access health services, they'll be asking each other to say, oh, even you, how did you contract it? As if you are somebody from Mars. They are forgetting that you are a human being. You have also feelings. And people, they infect you in one way or the other. So these are the issues which persons with disabilities, especially women, are going through in, in, in life. I think it's easy for us to imagine a rural health clinic in Africa that is not wheelchair accessible. But it's worth remembering that there are no ramps on the podiums at this international conference. So it's taken us 17 conferences to address the issue. But the International AIDS Conference itself can't provide ramps for speakers. And our interface with the conference in trying to negotiate the needs of people with disabilities in this session made uh, peace in the Balkans look easy. <laughs> Nora, we're talking about some stigma yes. that disabled people face within the healthcare well, field. I'm just going to build on what Rachel said and just uh, and what you said as well. Um, the stigma, uh, the, uh, starting with the belief that women who are disabled and men with disabilities as well are not sexually active means that it's not unusual for a person with a disability, even if they're able to make it into an AIDS testing center, be turned away by a health professional who says you couldn't possibly be infected. So it is not unusual for, the, for health professionals to refuse to even offer tests. However, if someone is fortunate enough to be able to be tested, the problems don't stop there. We often prioritize, in term, under the banner of limited resources, um, AIDS medication, AIDS care, and the social um, and economic supports that are available in many countries should you be HIV positive. These are often unavailable to people with disabilities. There's often a list of priorities, and people with disabilities are always at the, list, uh, at the bottom of this list. Should we be able to get AIDS medications to everybody else, and the economic supports to everybody else, and the social supports, then maybe come back and we'll see what we can do for you. But of course, it'll be years before we get those supports to all who need them if we go by a list of priorities and people with disabilities are simply dying in the meantime. In fact, I would venture to guess that most people with disabilities who are HIV positive and then, be, then um, have AIDS, in fact, never see the inside of a clinic or a healthcare facility and are dying undiagnosed at home. And we don't have many numbers because there's not a lot of money for research, but we also don't have many numbers because I think the majority of people with disabilities are not even making it past the, the testing centers. Yet Nabersh, I know you want to come back in. Yeah, maybe I, I just want to put it in a very short manner like that. I mean, HIV AIDS by itself uh, is a complicated issue, but I think the ideology is People think that HIV AIDS is discriminatory, but the reality is not discriminatory. We would have loved if HIV AIDS has discriminated us as we faced from the community. Yeah, if it had been the vice versa, we would have benefited, and even my, my brother from Kenya, Washington, would have access to a beautiful lady than the others, the hearing ones would have. So, I mean, the, the issue is like HIV AIDS is non discriminatory, it doesn't discriminate. And I think it, HIV it has been wider than we are by this. Human beings are being discriminatory, while the challenge HIV is non-discriminatory. You see how the change is? 
you, you see how the difference is and i mean most most in most of the cases like the, the the problem the attitudinal barrier that they face by being disabled is worse and is doubled by getting hiv because i mean that means challenge plus challenge because both things are taken as a challenge so challenge plus challenge is equal to the challenge just oh, well, i don't know i'm not a good mathematician <laughs> but in any case i mean challenge plus challenge because you people dealing with hiv aids okay you're dealing with one challenge but we dealing with both disability and hiv aids we are dealing with challenge plus challenge ground plus two challenge so i don't know how you perceive it that's where we lie our grounds that's where we say so challenge plus challenge is taking us the world where i never know I think it's challenge squared. I want, sure, I want to break good. the barrier here between the, between the panel and the audience. And as we're talking about um, sexual stereotypes of people with disabilities, um, I had a conversation earlier with one of our audience members, okay, not a totally disconnected person from this panel, but Miroslava, you were saying stuff about how people with disabilities react to the stereotypes about them and how the relationship between the person and the stereotype also leads to other vulnerabilities. I'm going to hold the mic, but tell me about it. Okay, so in discussions that I've had with other people with disabilities, you, you see that as you become aware of your stigma, then it changes the way that, that you feel that you might have to prove that you are a sexual being. So in that way, if you think that everyone sees you as asexual, then maybe you feel that, okay, I have to go out and I have to have a partner or I have to have children in order to prove my humanity and to prove my full identity as a person. So in that way, if in a way that it, because of that pressure, it exposes you to more risk. Shonali. I was actually wanting to add a challenge to Yetna Versha's list. Um, I think this panel is called Double Discrimination, but when you fold in gender to that, um, it gets worse. And one thing that I heard a lot from women in Uganda was that just sort of the sense that they're caught between gender roles. And so in many cultures, women are expected to get married, have many children. Many women with disabilities do that and want to do that. Yet when they become pregnant or try to access reproductive health care, they're chastised by health workers for starting a family or for bringing a child into the world. They're told they cannot be mothers and why would they do this? And so sort of the gender roles are forced on them at the same time as the stigma against disability is forced on them. And understandably, that makes them not want to go to doctors or get reproductive health care, and so then HIV comes into it. So I think gender complicates all of it as well. So it's really triple challenges often. And to, uh, also to add another, yet another complication, uh, women with disabilities are at greatly increased risk of being victims of violence. Uh, and once they're victims of violence, they're often told by their uh, families, if they go to the police, by the police, by other people in their communities, be it uh, spousal violence or partner violence or uh, uh, rape by strangers in the street. They're told they're lucky to get any attention and they should be grateful for someone being willing to partner with them even if the partner is violent. And so police, judges, the whole legal system also gives them very little or no ability to, um, to seek safety. Um, most of, uh, most of domestic violence shelters and programs in the developing world that are starting to come up on to provide um, uh, uh, help for women who are victims of violence do not allow women with disabilities to, part, to be um, uh, uh, members or to seek their services. They're inaccessible and they're inattentive and essentially they just compound the, the problems that women face.